Welcome to this podcast series on neo-charismatic leadership with author, leadership expert and coach, Dr. Gada Angawi and executive leader, Martin Headley, where they will both explore the recently published book, Neo-Charismatic Leadership and the coaching topics it covers. Welcome back, everybody, and hello again, Gada. Hi. Last time, we talked about this very important role, and certainly as coaches, this is really one of the favorite roles for, for you and I, of developing people. And we were considering, for the most part, what happens in bigger organizations. But we do want to look at what happens in the very small organizations, you know, startup organizations, small charities, SME businesses, for example, because what we were talking about is just as important. And I might even argue that it's even more important in smaller companies for the near charismatic leader to pay attention to. What do you say, Gada? Yeah, true. We have always focused our second episode on the same role on small businesses and small teams and social entrepreneurs, just because we know these people serve the big organizations by their expertise and and they actually contribute largely to many big organizations' presence. So we need to make sure that these people survive and they have uh, good people development in place, regardless of the size of their team. True. And uh, from personal experience, I have been there. I can say a lot about it. I have started personally from scratch. I feel that the best thing one can do when they overcome a challenge as an individual leader who is starting their business and learning how to do the business that this challenge becomes a learning opportunity for them. They need to sit, they need to reflect, and they need to use the learning to teach someone else because the best way of learning is moving that knowledge from your position to someone else's position, giving it. And it means that you have to get out of your comfort zone and share what you have learned. And uh, some people, some leaders uh, in in small organizations or small businesses think, no, I'm not going to share this with someone else because they'll compete with me. Because most of your colleagues and peers out there are also your competitors, aren't they? I mean, we are coaches and we work in coaching environments, but this is really not going to help you. From my experience, I have shared so much knowledge with others for free. I've helped other coaches build their businesses. I have walked them through the process of, you know, bidding for government contracts. I have also helped them think about writing a book and how to publish a book. Everything I have done in my small business, I have helped others to do on a personal level, one-on-one level, whoever approaches me saying, how did you do that? I'll just say, okay, let's have a cup of coffee and I'll tell you exactly what you need to be doing to, and, and what, what happens out there if you started doing so and so. And they learn from me. So I'm, I'm delivering constantly the knowledge to others. And the more I deliver, the more I am confident of what I have. Because if people succeed because of something I've given them a learning, I feel that my learning was worth it. <laughs> I feel that the process of how I achieved my success works. So I can now move that process into a bigger, wider audience. And this is when the second step comes, when you start delivering webinars, when you go to speaking opportunities, and when you start coaching others on the process itself. So this is really two important things that I have done personally. And um, the fourth was I started sharing the knowledge with recorded videos. So, you know, I I just show up on the screen, I talk about uh, something and I, in a short clip, and I just, you know, publish it on Instagram and YouTube. Then there is also the live sessions, which my confidence has built enough that I could sit there in live sessions and um, talk to people, answer their questions. And my mind would just go through the process again. So it became a habit. Uh, The process became so smooth, so streamed that it became easy for me to talk about it and teach people how to do it. So the live posts, no matter how frightening they are, how, you know, you're not used to it, I might not look right, I might stutter. 
just go ahead and try them because life disappears. You you can just disregard it. People just meet you somewhere and, and talk to you. And then, you know, they go on their way. Nobody's recording that. It's okay. You know, you, you can let go of it. And then the, the last uh, way of doing it is writing. You can write blogs on the learning you've gained, short blogs, make them short, make them precise, make them three steps because people can't read long things. And you can also write books on the process and self-publish or find the publisher. And finally, what we are doing today, Martin, is so easy, so convenient for people to tap into without having to look at us. They can listen to us as we discuss a topic that could be of great learning to others in small businesses. That's really interesting. And I love to hear how you're describing making this so natural that you don't even think about it. Yes. That's when you know that, uh, you know, you, you really are putting together all of these leadership concepts very well. And, and people are just responding to you, which is great. So how about you, Martin? How did you, I, I know you used to work in corporate and big organizations as an executive, and, and now you have your own business. How do you feel about developing others in your small business environment? In the beginning of doing small businesses rather than major corporations, I fell into the usual trap of thinking about learning and development as training only. And that's not the right answer, as I said before, but it did take me a while to realize this. And I just started to ask people, well, what learning and development do you want? And I was getting some blank stares back, which never would have happened in a big organization. So I had to rethink my whole approach. And I've started or restarted a number of entrepreneurial companies now, including my own. And I think I've got it down. So I've got a recipe here and I'm going to give you the recipe. The main way is just the challenge of getting started in a new organization. When you think about it, even if the organization that you're starting is not something new, you know, it's been done in other places. It may be that it's totally new to this particular group of people that are working on it. In fact, it usually is. So there's a lot of learning and development just to understand what the business is. You know, who is the community we're serving? Are we giving them the right products and services? Are they likely to come back? Are we likely to grow? That in itself is a huge challenge. And by spreading or creating and spreading a vision and a mission, you can certainly create a buzz around that. And I think that's what tends to generate momentum, particularly for startup companies. But after a while, that just becomes routine, which is good, but you've got to do something more. And this is where I realized if you're not having the team members work together about 30% of the time, and by together, I mean working on shared learning as well as delivery then you're not giving them enough time to learn and grow. And that's where you're going to lose them. It's very interesting that, you know, 30% of the time, let's say you're on a 40-hour work week, so you're talking about 12 hours a week spent on joint tasks. Well, that doesn't mean, here's something I want you to do, go and do it for 12 hours. What it means is, here is something that I'd like to achieve. How do you, team, think that you're going to do it? Now, all of a sudden, you've created a totally different type of objective from the usual. You've given them a challenge that you and they don't know how to solve. And so it's well worth them spending 12 hours of their 40 of that week to work out how to do what it is that you asked or how to create what it is that you asked. And of course, they're going to come back to you and they'll say, well, what about this? Do you think this will work? And you can then get into a discussion. So what is happening now is the learning and development is becoming interactive with the progression and the growth of the business and its knowledge itself. So so that's probably the second most important thing. That will sustain learning and development for a very long time if you can continue to do that. The third, the third part of this recipe, though, is that, you know, you've got to show that you or the company, if it's not just you, is listening to their learning and development. Is the company moving along with them? Because if you're listening to what they're finding out, you will probably need to make changes. For example, 
all right, the community that we support is actually bigger than we thought, or the people that are buying our product are wanting something slightly different. So what are you going to do? Are you just going to say, oh, well, we're going to continue on the same path, or are we going to react to that listening? If you react to that listening, again, the team members now are even more energized because it's valuable for them to learn because you will take note. You're learning with them. Yes, absolutely. Everybody's learning with them. So it's absolutely role modeling, but it's more than role modeling. It's just the way that you do business. And then finally, I like to find opportunities for the individuals to discover new things along the lines of their interests. So let's give you an example. You have three people that have the same job title and fundamentally the same role. And it's marketing, for example. But you find that one person is most interested in the technological side. So, you know, social media, websites, etc. You find somebody else is more interested in the graphical and the design side of marketing. And you find the third person is interested more in the organizational implications of marketing. Well, now you can let them all branch out and start learning different things in the directions that they want to learn. But all of it is coming back to the organization. And that's what provides a lot of power. So all of this can be supported by a self-learning platform. And I know this is something that you like, Gada. So why don't you talk a little bit about the self-learning platform? Yeah. But before I do that, I have a question for you, Martin. Some leaders in small businesses might say, so I pay them to learn. Like, is this a good way to invest my money? I, I barely have enough money for the project because, you know, it's a small business and we're struggling, we're starting. How does that work? Why don't I just hire people who know how to do the job from the, why do I have to grow from the grassroots? Yes, you, you will typically be picking people to work with you that have got some idea of what's going on. That's true. But nobody has the shared knowledge that your company is going to get by learning and developing together. And it is that shared knowledge that becomes the engine of growth in the organization. So to that question, I would say you can't afford not to do this. Mm. So no matter how highly qualified the individuals you hire for the job, they are still going through the learning with you and it becomes a shared knowledge customized for your organization only. This is really a great answer because many people might feel doubtful at, uh, you know, having to invest time and money growing other people, especially when they themselves are struggling. So let's go back to the platforms. I always thought that creating a platform is something impossible, very challenging. But really, when I got into it, it was so it was challenging, but it was not impossible. And it's important to have a group of people who are doing the same thing along with you. It's inspiring to see others doing it as well. So it is a lot of technology. You have to be able to learn and persevere because it takes time. Technology had made it easy for us now to create intellectual and learning platforms. So it's not impossible at all. You can just Google anything you don't understand or just ask your peers or the experts. The reason I'm saying this, a learning platform will help you streamline your process as an individual leader and help you also transmit that knowledge to others in a streamlined way and also helps you understand the process of uh, self-learning the learning theory, the learning styles, and how they arrive to conclusions. So you are actually taking a training course in education. You're learning about learning. And it will come back again to your own personal life because you will use those skills with your family. So these things are really critical. They teach you the, the process of learning. And we are all, as I said in the beginning of last episode, we're all communities. Communities are people and people all about learning how to do things in life so that they can have a better quality of life. So you can be a really part of a very vibrant movement in the global arena of business and social life virtually using learning platforms. And if you choose to do so, there's a lot of resources out there to help you 
and get your team involved because they are also capable of designing your training, the fact that you're preparing them for that role as well, because everybody needs to know about learning and development. Well, Gada, this leads very nicely into the area of succession planning. Because when you think about a small organization, even if you did hire people that came in and had the particular skills that you needed and they were all different, you still somehow have to make sure that the organization can continue. So over time, you'll be able to develop people and somebody perhaps will rise to the top and and will be able to take over when you go. But what about if... God forbid there is something happens that takes you out of the picture suddenly. And I think about some of the companies that I've had where I was the, let's put it lightly, the very experienced person and the other individuals were relatively young. In that situation, it would be very difficult for the company to continue if the younger members of the team didn't have some understanding of where I was coming from, that we hadn't done joint learning and development that we hadn't tried to expand our knowledge and create this joint shared knowledge. So yes, if I had suddenly disappeared, they would be stuck and they would know that they would need help from somebody who has similar experience to me, but they wouldn't stop. The organization could continue to run. They would know enough about what's going on. And it's that ability, you know, if you sit as a leader and think, If I was suddenly taken out of the picture tomorrow, could this team continue and grow? And would they be able to figure out what else they need to be successful? And if you can truly answer yes, then I think you've really put people development into the forefront of your leadership. You've really put your organization into a very, very strong position. And you're not going to let down others that you care for if you're no longer in the picture. So I think that that's the true value of succession planning, not just an exercise from HR. Yes. And by spreading learning and development to others, regardless of whether they work in your company or they don't, you are actually leaving a legacy of your own presence in this world. It will be something that uh, your life hasn't gone to waste, something you've left behind. Someone else will pick up that knowledge and use it for their company or for the community or for their families. So our aim and purpose in life is to make it a better place. And this is exactly what altruistic, ethical, new charismatic leaders do. I think we came to the end of our episode, Martin. So we have one more episode left and I really look forward to concluding this series with you. Thank you listeners for contributing to to all this series and we'll see you next time in our finale. Goodbye for now. Yes. Thank you, Garda. Thanks everybody. Goodbye. Garda and Martin, hope you enjoyed this episode. There is more information available at neocharismaticleadership.org. And if you would like to discuss coaching or training for yourself or your team, you can contact Garda and Martin through the website. We look forward to your participation next week. Until then, goodbye.